Okay. Um, so, um, so this creates a, an object representing the figure is f, and then an object representing just the axes. So, the 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 region of the figure where you actually are, are plotting something is is the ax, and you can and then and so then we just want to plot the the uh, the position along the along the, the flame length, so that's flame.grid uh, versus the temperature. Uh, and then we just set some labels for the plot, and that's that, and that's very large. Uh, command. command minus? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there is the temperature profile of the flame. And so we can see that, yeah, it, it goes to this grid size that is further than what was originally specified. Uh, you could see that if you looked at the log, but if you if you didn't if you weren't watching that, you'd be like, oh, actually, it had to it had to go to a, a larger width to actually accommodate the flame. Because if it, if you only, if you try to fit this in just a two centimeter domain, you can see that this wouldn't have really reached that steady state um, condition. Um, uh, similarly, we can uh, we can plot the the species. Uh, that are present. Um, so this is using another um, uh, another feature that Cantera has for for uh, collecting for representing multiple states of a gas of a, of a solution. So normally, when you have just the the uh, the gas object, right, that that just has one state. So it has one temperature, pressure, and set of mole fractions. But there's a lot of cases like the flame where you want to represent. Um, a whole range of states. Um, so this could be in the in the case of a flame. This is the the states across the whole flame. Uh, for a reactor model, this would be the states as as a function of time. Um, and the solution array is a way of, of representing all of those states and being able to very quickly pull essentially all of the same kind of properties. So like being able to look at the mass fractions or being able to look at some you know derived quantities like the like the rates of reaction things like that. Um, at, at, at that whole range of points at once. And so what we're doing is we're creating an, a, a solution array based on this gas object, um, and it will have the number, the shape is, is how many, so how many points it has. You can actually do multi-dimensional arrays if you like, but this is just a, a one-dimensional case. And so it has as many points as there are in the in this plane. Um, and then we say, well, in addition to all the variables that the, the gas itself has, uh, we also need one extra variable, which is we'll call it z, which is the position along the plane. Um, and then we can set the so the same way that we set the ppx or ppy for a gas, we now set these with arrays. So flame.p is an array of all the, the temperatures. Flame.p is actually a scalar, but that gets converted to the same value for all all of these points. And then the flame dot um, y is the mass fractions. Um, unfortunately, it ends up being, so that's a 2D array, but it's actually in the wrong orientation, so you have to do this dot t, which is the transpose, to flip it into the right shape that this function uh, wants it to come in. Um, and then we can use this, this profile to do the plot, so we create the plot again, plot z versus, um, so this is, this is like the slicing syntax that I guess that Brian kind of skipped over before. But we say I want I want to know I want the the mole fractions profile of that x is the mole fractions, but I don't want the whole uh, 53 by 147 array of that. I <coughs> the mole fractions of CH4, um, and then plot the different the, the different major species. Um, and so that's that's this, and so there's all the major species, and you can plot obviously any other species you like. Uh, in the same way, um, and Jupiter provides some nice little features. So th these are actually using the Jupiter the the Matplotlib notebook interface. These plots are interactive, so you can pan and zoom. So if you want to look actually more at the um, at just the I can't do it. There we go. And zoom in a little bit on on the actual flame front. Um, or, or reset the view, so you can do it. You can do it. You can do some nice interactive things with the plots um, as well. Uh, uh, one one thing that people often, very often want to do is when they're looking at a mechanism. And uh, yes. How how the, how I get the plot? 
the, these are, so these are the commands that generate the plot. Um, I mean, Cantera's doing a lot under the hood, right? To make that easier, but that's all just those lines of code. So, so all of yeah, all of all the data that goes into this plot is what's in this flame object in these variables, the t, p, and and y. So those are the, the, the that's the state of of the of the of the of that flame object. All the all the variables that that it solved for. Um, so uh, oftentimes you, you want to be able to do a sensitivity analysis on the flame speed. So uh, to be able to compute the sensitivity of, of the flame speed with respect to any of the uh, reaction rate coefficients is, is kind of the commonest use case. And that's, uh, there, there's a fairly simple interface for that in Cantera, which is to say just get flame speed reaction sensitivities. Um, so this uses the, the, the adjoint method of, of computing all of these sensitivities uh, for, the, for that steady state solution. Um, there's a lower level interface to this that would let you define your own objective function uh, for, for that, um, uh, but we're not going to cover that here. Um, so that runs fairly quickly. And then, that's a, so that would give us an array of, we have there's 325 reactions in the full GRI mech, and I think without the, the nitrogen mechanism, there's some 200 some odd. Uh, reactions, so we don't really want to look at all of them. We know that a lot of those are not very important, but what, we, what we're interested in then is um, the, the reactions that have the highest sensitivities. Uh, so one way that we can get that, uh, get the, just that subset of them is to use Python to, uh, to sort this array of sensitivities by, uh, by, by, their, by their size. So uh, one way of doing this in, in Python is to do uh, what, what's called uh, decorating a, a uh, variable. So instead of just having this list of sensitivities, we actually need, we, we, want, to, uh, we want to know which ones are actually the most important. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to store the, uh, re the corresponding reaction equation. So we're, this is, this is a, a, what Python calls a list comprehension, where we're, we're building a list that has two items for each element. Um, where one, one is the sensitivity, and then this is the, the reaction equation for that reaction. So we just do that loop over the, the list of reactions uh, uh, and, and build this list, and then we tell Python that we want to sort this list, and then for each item, so each item in this list is, is this tuple of, of two things. So item zero is the sensitivity, and we care about its absolute value. And we want the and we want to get the ones that are the largest. So normally Python would sort in a ascending order. So we'd start off with a with sensitivities near uh, with absolute value near zero uh, and go up. And so we actually want to do this the other way around. We get the the, the largest ones first. And so we say reverse. Um, and then after that, we can take this 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 sorted array and plot the first twenty um, items in it. Um, and look at the sensitivity coefficients for those reactions. Um, and so these are then the, the sensitivity coefficients for, for the 20 most important reactions in this flame, and obviously that, that would change depending on your reaction mechanism or the initial conditions. Uh, any questions? Um, so the last thing I wanted to show off on the, the laminar flame speed example was uh, this idea of doing a parameter sweep where, where you have where you're working from uh, you want to solve a bunch of cases that are that are um, near one another um, and and this is an efficient way of doing that. So if you wanted to, to do something like sweep an equivalence ratio range, um, you start at one end of that range. So we're, we're going to do a sweep for starting at an equivalence ratio of, of 0 0.6. Um, so to do that, we'll just reset the gas object the same way to the initial conditions that we that we wanted. Uh, recreate the flame object and set the, um, the the properties and solve. This time I've set the log level to zero just because I don't actually want to see all the output. Um, so this is the, this is our our one endpoint solution. So we can run that. Um, and that that should finish fairly quickly. Um, so that starts at one end, and then what we want to do is we say so this this we solved with auto. But now we're going to solve uh, without without auto specified. 
and we're going to loop over loop over equivalence ratios from 0 0.6 to 1.8. And this is a we're going to do 50 uh, simulations, and then we create a, so we create a list for the flame speed, um, and each for each of the equivalence ratios in that list, we set the um, set the equivalence ratio. But we leave so our flame object we keep we keep that flame object around, and we actually just change the uh, the mass fractions of the inlet to match the ones of this of this gas object that we just changed, and then we and then we solve again. Um, one thing that is important is when you're doing a a a, a, a sweep like this is that uh, normally if you if you if you don't specify your uh, a pruning value in the refinement criteria, it will never remove points; it will only add more points. So each each of your iterations would just keep going. And, and and adding more points. Um, and so what you can do to, to make it so that that grid doesn't just keep growing without bound is to add a pruning tolerance. So now if it has more points than it needs in a certain region, it can actually just remove them. Um, and that, that'll keep the grid size manageable. And you need this pruning tolerance should be lower than either of the, the other two tolerances. Otherwise, it will uh, not work. Um, and so we, we solve uh, in this loop. And print out the the flame speed at each one, and then we'll we'll just store the the flame speed in this list su. Um, so that's what that, that append does is, is it just builds up the elements of that list. And so we can run that, and it goes. And so you can see that this runs fairly quickly for each iteration. It doesn't take too long to loop over this. Um, Um, so that's done, and then we can do we can plot this. So this was our, our list of equivalence ratios, our list of flame speeds. We just create a new figure and plot that, and so that you've done your 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 flame speed curve in not too many lines of code. Um, so any questions? How would you <coughs> go in the loop over like temperature and speed on the temperature? Um, How would that subject change? The if you did that, probably you would want to um, restart it at for each whichever variable you have fewer instances of to, to actually restart the simulation on those because otherwise you're going to at some point you'll be making a very large jump in the initial condition right when it gets to the end of one loop and it goes back to the the first one of that so I mean, you could write a nested for loop with the two. Um, but I think that would be a little like the, the easiest. I think I think you'd want to in the outer loop do a, a fresh simulation. If you were feeling very clever, you could sort of do it as a zigzag. Um, so do each one in opposite directions so that you are always solving a nearby case. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because it's, you 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 want to avoid doing on a on a dense grid taking and changing the conditions drastically because that's going to cause the solver to have to make a lot more tries to, to get to the to the steady state when in a case where it's already got all these grid points there as opposed to it you know might be more efficient to say to just you know if you if you don't actually know what a, a nearby state is be like okay I'm just gonna scrap it and, and start over. Um, so this, this works easiest in one dimension. In two dimensions you could you could traverse that matrix in, in a in a uh, back and forth pattern that would that would keep you always nearby though. Um, so let's see. So kind of along those lines, are you going to go into more detail on tricks for the solver, not converging, or so um, there are there are very so at this point there are very few instances I know of where the solver doesn't work. Um, we're going to talk. We I have an example of one of those in the afternoon that uh, going to show some of the things you can do to sort of dig into what's going wrong. Um, so, uh, can I uh, order this one? It's very hard to type backwards. <laughs> Uh, so in the uh, examples on the Cantera website, under Python examples, there are 
a whole bunch of other flame examples that cover um, the the different uh, flame geometries that you can simulate in Kintera, uh, including all of the different uh, counterflow flames, whether those be diffusion or premixed or uh, or uh, twin premixed, etc. Um, and and these all these all have basically this this kind of what what you need to set them up. The the, the structure of this is very similar to to any to, to what I showed. It's, it's you know you're setting up setting some parameters that that are used. You, you create a gas object. You you create uh, so there's different. So the, the main difference is that you you use a different class to represent that basic structure of the flame. Um, so the, the example I showed earlier was free flame. This is the counterflow diffusion flame class. Um, here you have you have more inputs in the case of the counterflow diffusion flame since you have inputs on both ends of the domain that you need to set up. So there's a fuel inlet and an oxidizer inlet that you need to set uh, a mass flow rate, composition, and temperature of. Um, but then in the end, you, you still you still set the same kind of things. Uh, solve uh, you can save you can save the solution as a, either an XML file or to a CSV file if you if you don't want to if you want to save it for later or you want to plot it in some other tool. Um, um, but but the basic the basic structure of of doing these simulations is very similar for all the different uh, types. Um, and and yeah, so there's examples of all the different um, all the different flame types that Ginter can solve here. Um, I think that's all I had on the flames. Okay, so building off of that, we're going to go and look at non-ideal gas models. How are we on time? We got 45 minutes. 12? Yeah, yeah and we got one. You're going to go after me, is that right? Uh, yeah, I'll do the Kim Kim stuff after okay. you. Yeah. Okay, okay. So... Yeah, so all the examples so far have been ideal gas models. Um, you know, as we start to drive toward higher and higher pressures, particularly in some combustion applications, uh, certainly it's relevant to look at whether there are non-ideal effects. Uh, I'll give some commentary on that a little bit later. But uh, the one non-ideal gas model that Kentara has in there right now um, that's particularly useful is a multi-component Redley-Kwong equation of state. Um, I would say we're this close to having a Peng Robinson, but we've been this close for a while. That's on my back. But uh, anyway, um, so, so there's the equation of state, right? Obviously, you're departing from ideality. You need to have these A and B input parameters. Um, and again, Cantera is using a mixture averaging algorithm in there to figure out what those A and B parameters are as a function of temperature, pressure, and chemical composition to determine the repulsion and attraction parameters. Um, so yeah, and you can compare that to the ideal gas equation, obviously. Um, so we're going to compare first some properties of a mixture with carbon dioxide, water, hydrogen, and CO. Um, and so let's just walk through what that looks like. Again, as we have with everything else, we're going to start by importing the necessary modules, aliasing them as necessary, and setting some parameters for the matplotlib. Uh, again, this is the non-ideal gas model. I kind of jumped into that quickly, but that's the notebook I'm working out of here. So nothing too... Fancy there. First thing I'll just show is just some of the basic phase behavior of this and how it is inherently different. Um, so we're going to look through a bunch of temperatures um, from 282 to 380. Um, steps of two, I guess. We're going to um, look at pressures relative to the critical pressure, right? So we're crossing, we're, it, this is a transcritical phase diagram, right? From below the critical pressure to above the critical pressure. So I'm going to just create an array of those, pr those pressures, um, read out the number in, of pressure temperatures, which is probably not necessary if you know Python better, but I didn't when I wrote this. Um, and we're going to just do a phase diagram. So specific volume for a range of temperatures and pressures. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is actually load an ideal gas. And this sort of speaks to what I was talking about later, or what I was talking, what I was talking about earlier, which is, uh, <laughs> I'm present. Um, yeah. Which is to say, if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. And Cantera is not designed to say, hey, that's not right. right? We leave it to you to know what you're doing. right? And so here, I can make a phase diagram for an ideal gas solution. Right? So I go through and I run through this range of pressures and temperatures. I'm calculating. I set the state. And then I calculate specific volume. I just did it like that. I hope it's pretty fast. right? Um, and to keep them straight, I loaded this and I called this object ideal gas. Right, so that's my ideal gas object, and I'm interrogating that particular object. 
Okay, let's go ahead and we'll make a figure. And here it is, right? This is my phase area and it's mostly water, right? So I'm moving across where I should see phase change. You don't see any, right? Cantera is not telling you that. It's, it's, inherent on, it's incumbent on you to know that you're loading an ideal gas model. It's not going to tell you that, that, that you have phase change, right? So just buyer beware on that. Um, Right, so now we'll load from that same file. I've got two different phases. So this is why we give these phase names, right? Your CTI file, oh, interesting. Your CTI file can have any number of phase definitions, right? And so that first one, I said, okay, go find the ideal gas. Now I'll go ahead and find this carbon dioxide, and I'm going to save it to an RK gas. We'll go over the same range of temperatures and pressures and calculate the specific volume. Okay, and now I'll create my plot. And where did I go? And so now you do, right? You can see your phase change process here. It's uh, the really Kwong, you know, it doesn't, you should have constant temperature obviously during phase change. It doesn't quite nail that, but it's getting you the right qualitative behavior, right? So a superheated vapor region over here. You can sort of see the shape of your saturated uh, mixture dome and then compressed liquid over here. You can see it going through the critical point here and supercritical fluid there, right? So again, qualitatively different and, and more correct behavior here, obviously. Okay, um, so that's, that's just showing sort of general behavior. So here's uh, showing you some chemical reaction rates, okay? And so one you could look at is water gas shift reaction, which is actually an important one uh, for these supercriticals because it does depend inherently on pressure, right? Um, actually not. All right, so it does not actually. So you can change the pressure and all the effects you're going to see are due to the thermodynamics, right? It's an equal molar reaction. So it's not going to, you're not, the pressure is not pushing it one way or the other. It's just the thermodynamics. Okay, so we're going to look at the water gas shift reaction and this is part of that, that uh, CTI file. So we're going to set up some initial conditions, both for the Redley Kwong and for the ideal gas. We're going to make a reactor, which is a Cantera module. It's a zero dimensional reactor. So just a homogeneous, spatially uniform mixture. Um, and then, so we load it, we create it, and then you create a reactor network based on a reactor. Um, I'm going to be intentionally vague by that because I don't use these very often. If you ever see me contribute to the user group, I usually start with, well, I don't use this very often, but, so anyway. Can I, can I jump in? Maybe certainly, I certainly. Please do, please so, do. So um, basically the, the reactor implements your energy equation and, uh, and the, the um, chemical kinetics well, the chemical kinetics are in the solution. The reactor implements your energy equation here. And then the reactor network is the interface to the solver. So for all of these, so the energy equation is going to be represented as a, for a zero-D reactor is an ordinary differential equation. DE dt is equal to some terms on the right-hand side of that. The reactor network is the interface to the integrator that will actually integrate that ordinary differential <coughs> equation. Because this is a zero-D reactor, we're integrating through time. Okay, so we have to create both the reactor and the reactor network. In Cantera, we have a couple of specializations here. So the general reactor is implemented with the energy equation in terms of the enthalpy. So it's totally general for any equation of state. You can write the, the energy equation in terms of the enthalpy. The second one down here is the ideal gas reactor. And this is specialized for ideal gases. For ideal gases, the enthalpy is a function of the temperature only. Whereas for a general substance, the enthalpy is a function of temperature and pressure. So for the ideal gas reactors, we can change how the energy equation is implemented to be only in terms of the temperature. And when you have an ideal gas, that solving that differential equation in terms of the temperature is a little bit faster and a little bit more stable. Why a lot faster? Because <laughs> the, the general one is also function composition for non-ideal gas, right? So Well, the, the ideal gas one's a function that's of composition, you're right, too. You're right, you're right. That's right. Yeah, so. okay. All right. Okay. Ryan, yes, sorry. Instead of a single reaction, you want to fully develop the model. You, this would be the way to run it and yep. the super dimensional yep. reactor, but you would have to input the human steps. You have to yeah. solution. We'll see that a little further down. So yeah, way. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is just a simple start, but yeah, we're going to look at it something all the way down that, that shows a full set of reactions. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah. So now I'm going to, I'm just looking ahead, I'm going to load out a, a list of mole fractions. So I create some empty structures and times, which I'm going to plot later. Again, there are multiple ways to do that. That's how I chose to in this case. 
and now we'll integrate the reactor. And so we are setting a time of 100 seconds. So while the time is less than 100, keep integrating. And then once you reach that condition, it's going to kick out. Can, can you talk about the step method versus like the advanced method? Sorry? Are you going to talk about that later? Uh, step versus no, advanced. I'm not. You want to talk about it? <laughs> sure. Yeah. All right. Sorry. I'm taking over your That's OK. Your That's so fine. For the reactor network, that's what's implementing your uh, in interaction with the integrator. There are two methods that you're, you can use to advance the integrator in time. One is called step, and the other is called uh, advance. So here we have reactor network RK dot step. Uh, this is going to take one internal time step in the integrator. The integrator that we use is called Seaboats. Uh, it's developed at, at Lord Livermore National Lab uh, as part of the Sundials um, kind of general solver package. Uh, that's a variable time stepping algorithm. So the solver will determine the time step that it needs to take to maintain the accuracy level uh, that's, that's desired for the solver. So the step method takes one internal time step of whatever time step size the solver thinks is appropriate. So this while loop here is checking the, uh, when, after the network takes the step, it returns the time back. So every time you go through this loop, you're going to set the time equal to the time that you reached at the end of that step. And the while loop is checking and making sure that, uh, or it's going to kind of stop uh, iterating when that time gets to be 100 seconds. We want to stop iterating at 100 seconds here. The other method is called advance. Uh, in advance, for the advance method, you're going to pass in the end time of the simulation. And Kentera, or the solver, is going to take as many time steps as it needs to until it gets to that end time. Okay, so you might use that if you wanted to advance a reactor to steady state, although we also have a method to do that now, which is somewhat new. But Would it store the internal time steps for advance? Or it does not store the internal time right. steps. It just jumps all the way to the end there. So if you want to get the data at each time step, use the step method. All right. So doing that, right, we're saving what the time of that time step is. We're saving the mole fraction of the third species, right, 0, 1, 2 for the RK gas, and then for the ideal gas as well, doing the exact same thing. Saving all that data. Okay. And then we're going to plot. And so this is the water. We're looking at the water mole fraction. And well, first we did it at a low pressure. Um, so I didn't mention that up here, but pressure is one atmosphere, right? So we should not expect to see much non-ideality, and in fact, when we compare our ideal gas and our Redley Kuang, they're exactly the same, right? It's low pressure. It should behave as an ideal gas. So the Redley Kuang can predict ideal gas behavior as well, obviously. Okay, so now let's run it for a very high pressure of 100 atmospheres. So we set it all up. This looks exactly the same as I did before, just a different pressure. I could use, Kenter has a function, so ct.1 underscore atm. Okay, and we'll go ahead and plot that. And so now at 100 atmospheres, you see, first of all, it happens a whole lot faster. This is the same time axis, right? When you saw this gradual slope down, it happens a whole lot faster just because your molecules are colliding a whole lot faster. And you do see some difference, but it is still pretty minor, I would say, right? It's not, it's not the biggest impact, um, but it is a quantitative difference at least. Okay, so now let's look at another example. And this is something where you know, um, Harry Moffat had developed this, and, and some other people contributed as well. Um, hadn't seen a whole lot of use, but you know, as again, as we started moving towards higher pressures, uh, we started to take a look at this Redley Kuang, and we wanted to take a look at the impact of these non-idealities on a combustion process. Um, and so we were looking at a shock tube. So here's a this will be an example of a full kinetic simulation in a zero D shock tube reactor. So you'll be modeling this as a constant volume reactor. Um, here's, your, here's the conservation equation, right? Constant volume, constant internal energy. Um, and so it's also a fixed constant mass, so that'd be no change in density. So those are the, that's what's sort of under the hood in your reactor model. Um, this was all published in Combustion and Flame about two years ago. Uh, one of the reviewers of that paper is in the room. He was very nice. Um, so, uh, and then also integrating the species conservation according to the reactions, right? So again, we're not implementing this. This is all in the Cantera reactor model, but just to give you an idea of what it's doing. Um, we're using pandas here just to help analyze the data. This is another popular package that people use. Um, 
Yeah, so again, we'll go through and we'll define the gas. Uh, this is a mechanism from uh, Wang and Ritz's group, uh, combustion, uh, post and fuel in 2014. So we'll go ahead and we'll load that file. That has all the reactions, a whole bunch of species. Yeah, Ken? Well, that's the set. Right there, that's where you import the model. Yes, yeah. Right, and so this is, you have all of this, right? So if you go to input files slash non ideal models, you all have this in your materials. But in our own case, we would substitute our own uh, mechanism. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. And we'll show you if you have a chemical mechanism, we're going to show a chemical conversion later. Yeah. All right. So yeah, I just loaded that. So now I have it. I called it gas. This is that full mechanism there. It's larger than the other one, which is why I was not using it for the earlier calculations. Uh, again, we'll, we're going to do all this at 1,000 Kelvin just to show these results. Uh, reactive pressure of 40, 40 atmospheres. Um, and so we'll go ahead and we set the state of the reactor. We set or the gas object. Set the equivalence ratio of 1. Again, name the fuel. This is endodecane versus air. Uh, then we make a reactor whose contents are that gas. And then we make a reactor network made up of that reactor. Uh, this is something I think related to, so state variable names. We are, actually I don't, our are not using ours. So that's going to get you like the temperature, pressure, and mass fraction. Okay, okay. The, the and then variables. we use pandas to make a data frame to store that data, which just makes it easier to sort and interrogate that after it's done. Okay, and then, yeah. Okay, so now we want to calculate the ignition delay, right? So there's a couple ways you can do this. Um, in our case, we're going to look at, we're going to name a key species and look for the max of that species. Look for the max um, slope in the, in the concentration or the mole fraction of that species. So we can still, we're going to be flexible at it in terms of what species. We define a function that helps us identify at what time that slope is at its max. Yeah? Wanted to run the model and get species as a function of time, you wouldn't go. To, you wouldn't even have to go to the step. No. You just run the box above. And you do the <coughs> plot it's going to be right here. Yeah. This yeah. is just for plotting. Yeah. Well, I'll show you down here. Okay. So we have to. We're going to call this function later. We haven't done anything yet. We're going to call this later to identify the ignition delay. I don't need this to run it. Right. I'll use this in post processing, but you can't call it until you define it. Right. So I'm defining it up here. I'm going to call it down below. Yeah. All right, so I don't remember if I did that at this point, but all right, and so now, yeah, now is where we'll run the model again. We're going to put an estimate in there. We're going to start at t to zero, and while that is less than our estimated, we're going to integrate. Again, be a little smart if you don't know, then just trace a big time, right? But the longer that is, the longer it might take. So anyway, we're going to take steps until we've exceeded that, that time and keep stepping it, right? Um, we're going to save only some of the steps, only every 20th step, just so we're not filling up a ton of memory. Um, and just this is again our data frame, and we're storing the state in there at that time t. Okay, and then we'll keep implementing that counter to tell us to count only every 20th step. Another thing that you can do in the while loop is actually interrogate the state of the reactor and break at, say, a particular temperature. So if you know that ignition. Say if you want to define ignition as like plus 400 Kelvin over the initial temperature, you can do while the temperature of the reactor is less than T0 plus 400, and then it will break when you hit that temperature. Or you can set that temperature higher and get the whole you know, profile perfect. Yeah. And so, so like, like Ken was saying, this we're, we've done. We've done the simulation now, right? And so now this is that ignition delay that we calculated that we defined before to interrogate afterwards for post-processing. In this case, we're going to look for the maximum slope of the hydroxide. Yeah, so that's going to be tau. We'll save that as tau. Uh, just to see how long it took, we'll calculate the time of starting and time of the end. And then print out some, print out some data about the simulation. OK, did it go? No, we're not. All right, so it takes a couple seconds. Um, no, it should be done now. Yeah, OK, so the initial delay was 4.1 e to the minus 4 seconds. It took us almost 4 seconds to do the, ca the calculation. We can go ahead and plot it. And so now you can see this is the OH mass fraction. You can see it's at zero. It spikes, hits a max, comes back down. And where that slope hit its maximum, that's what we define as the ignition, 
the IDT, the ignition delay time. Okay, um, one interesting behavior then is we wanted to look at the effect of non-ideality on the so-called negative temperature coefficient. Um, and so we ran this over a list of temperatures to look at how the negative, how the, the IDT changes as a function of temperature. And in some uh, cases, from measurements, you can see that you expect it would get faster with temperature, but there's a region where it actually gets slower with temperature, and that's known as the ne negative temperature coefficient, or NTC. So we look over a range of temperatures. Uh, we have a whole bunch of estimated emission delay times, um, and we store them at just that 0 0.005. Again, we're setting up our data structures. And then, basically, this is just a, we're running that same simulation over that loop of temperatures and storing the data. So we'll run that. It takes a second. If we don't want to wait, we really, you can see. So it's running through all those temperatures and outputting data. So we're starting high temperature and going to lower and lower temperatures, telling you how long it took to compute. It's quite a few. So I'll let that just run in the background and keep talking in the interest of time. And then what we're going to do, this plot is typically, typically shown as tau, the ignition delay, versus the inverse of temperature, 1,000 over T. Um, I'm not actually going to run it now, but this is just setting up your figure, right? Uh, defining things about your axes, is formatting. We don't worry too much about that. And so when we plot it now, you can see there's that negative temperature coefficient where the ignition delay actually increases as temperature is increasing. Okay, um, and so what we did there, one thing we haven't talked too much about is Git. Um, and so Cantera's source code is in GitHub. Um, that's how we manage it, that's how we manage updates to it. But one thing that's nice about that is that you can create branches or sort of parallel instances of the Cantera source code. And so one thing we had done here was we wanted to see the impacts of the thermodynamics and the equation of state versus the impact of kinetics. Um, typically, not a whole lot to talk about this, right? But when you look at kinetics, right, we think of it as just being your, your kinetic operator is the rate coefficient times the product of the concentrations raised to their stoichiometric coefficients, right? Buried in that is that's an ideal gas equation right there, right? You're assuming that the gamma, the activity coefficients, are one in an ideal gas. So in the non-ideal gas, it's important to remember that there is that activity coefficient there. So we wanted to look at just comparing, you know, what is the impact of the equation of state? Your density is changing as a function of temperature and pressure. And what's the impact of these activity coefficients? Um, and so, this so is no more calculations. Let's just check in and see how it's doing here. Did it finish? Yeah. Right, the other thing, we can talk about this, but when you see that book up there, it's done. If you see an hourglass, it's processing on something. There's also the, the gray circle in the upper right. Oh, gray there. circle, whereas it's right. Python 3. Yeah, that'll be building with gray when it's executing it. And you'll have an asterisk in there when it's executing. So a bunch of ways to know when you're chewing on something. Okay, so it's done. So again, we can go and plot that. It doesn't change the same thing as the last time I ran it. Okay, but uh, again, so these are some results that we published in Combustion of Flame. And just to say that you need to take care. So we can create these parallel verses where we just monkeyed with the equation of state, where we ignored the impact of the activity coefficient and just said, oh, just use the concentration. Uh, here's ideal gas, and here's where you said, okay, both ideal gas equation of state and the right activity coefficients. And interestingly, you see the opposite effect. If you ignore the effect on kinetics, you see the IDTs go up. And if you put in the impact of kinetics, you see the IDTs go down relative to the ideal gas model. Um, so that's at 40 atmosphere. If you go up to 60 atmosphere, we're zooming in on that NTC region. It's, it's notable differences, right? But I'll say it's not a game changer, right? This is not, you know, ignoring, if you ignore it entirely, if you look at the noise in the data, you know, it's important to know that, if, yes, you have to import the, the, the impact on the kinetics, but it's not a completely quanti qualitatively different result, right? It's pretty close within the, the range of the noise. Um, so it's just something to think about. When you're looking at flames and non-ideal impacts, the temperatures are so hot that your Z, your compressibility ratio, is usually pretty close to one anyway. So certainly if you're looking in that 10 to 25% area you know, of, of, of resolution, it matters. But other than that, I would say it's, it's you know, you're, you're, you're in the right ballpark with your ideal gas, particularly within our abilities to measure some of these things. So just, uh, just some food for thought on that. You know, certainly people are, there is a lot of interest on non-ideal equations to state out there. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about it, so I even hate to say this, I'm, you know, stepping on my own foot, but, but it's, it's 
a relatively small thing, you know, in terms of the actual impact when you look at the numbers. So anyway, that's at least one example of how to run something with a non-ideal gas and an example of a zero D reactor with a full kinetic mechanism. Okay. Any questions, Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, we'll go here and then there. Maybe on the step behind, though. what's the criteria used to define the ignition delay time? So in, in this case, we, here, one, one hint, if you get stuck in here, if I try and scroll on the figure, it doesn't work. If I put the power button, now it, it scrolls. Um, so it's here. Yes, so we're looking for the maximum slope in the mass fraction of the hydroxide in this case. Okay. So there's a couple different definitions in terms of you can look at the pH, <coughs> you can look at the max slope and temperature. There are some people who would take the max slope and temperature and backtrack it to where that intercepts the zero point. There's a lot of different definitions of ignition delay time. In this case, we defined it with this equation right here, which is to say, find the max, right, the ID ma IDX max, which means the max, the spot where the, the rate of change is the highest. For the species Sorry. to be fed. See that? I think it's yep. actually just the max. It is the max. Oh, really? It's just the max. max. Yeah. All right, thank you. Index of max. Yes. 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 index. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. So, yeah, we're finding the maximum concentration of OH in this case. And that's just, that's the standard we used here. So, yeah. So, that's what this figure is sort of showing you, right? Clearly, it's, it's not very different from. No, the, you're, yeah. The it's, slope location. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Thanks. Yeah, certainly. Okay, and there's. Yeah, I just had a silly question. Um, why do you call these reactor networks? Can you explain a little bit about the details of how the solver actually works? To do this? Well, it's, I think it's sort of like, you know, that you can combine more than one. So you can have, for example, you had a, if you want to chain a bunch of continuously stirred reactors to each other, you can form networks, right? You can, uh, and you can define the links between those network, those reactors. In other words, if I put a valve with a certain uh, pressure coefficient, things like that. So we're just focusing on single reactors but you can string them. And, and sort of the hint there actually is where I create the reactor network, there are square brackets around it, if I can find where I did that, or at least one example of that, here. So sort of a hint there is I've got these square brackets around R, which is a list, so it gives you the capability to put multiple reactors in series. That's definitely not a silly question. We're gonna do a PSR, a perfectly stirred reactor, in the afternoon uh, example, and so that's gonna involve a network of an inlet, a reactor, and an outlet. Okay, thank you. Uh, for details on the, the actual solver, I'd, I'd say catch us at a break or at lunch, maybe. There's a hand back there, yeah. So, if the real gas is better for us for this module, why do we need an identified real gas? Say that again? So, if the real gas is better for a specific volume, we need higher pressure. Why do we need more pressure? Meaning it's more, it's more accurate? Yeah. Well, right. So, I mean, it's more accurate, but it's, it's more about just how much does that impact the kinetics? I mean, that's sort of what we're looking at, right? And I would say two things. I mean, one is that the two effects are actually canceling each other, right? If you just look at the impact of the equation of state, the, the, that's just looking at the, the specific volume, right? The concentrations change. It increases IDTs, right? But then the impact of the kinetics decreases IDTs. And so I think the two are sort of, when you sum them, it's coming out close to zero because one's increasing and one's decreasing and they sort of negate each other. And so if you had two, and again, this is just one simulation for one, you know, one particular setup and one chemistry, but, but yeah, in this case at least, they're sort of working at cross purposes to sort of negate each other. But also it has to do with the high temperatures, right? You're at such a high temperature that you're sort of out near ideal gas anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can. Kind of. No, this is good. I hate, you know, the nature of boards of vacuum. So I, I'm trying, I think I'm getting the hang of where the classes of things we can do here yeah. are. On the Kentera site, yes. if I went to science and theory, we have all these reactors, and that tells you what reactors, like what, what's it for? Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to find what. Things we do. Right. So I would found is a zero dimensional mm -hmm. reactor and I found a zero reactor Right. So I think this So let me answer that in two ways. One is I would say, I don't know if you guys agree, but the science of theory is probably a place where I'd like to develop a little bit more. Yes. But so you can go here and see some 
the best is probably to go to the examples though, right? So if you go to the examples page, you know, the Python examples is probably the most exhaustive what can be done. of what can be done. Yeah, and you get you get an example and you really just get a file. If you download the file, it, it you know, you can we use that as a template to put in what you want. So this for at present, I would say going to the examples is the best the best way to see sort of a compendium of what's the most mature, you know. But there's there's more, yeah. <laughs> each one of those is considered a class. Oh, uh, I, well, a module. Oh, sorry? Every application is a class. Every file. Okay, so there's two ASANs to that. If I run this from like an interpreter or from my command line, it's just a Python file. I would write Python, soundspeed.py, hit enter, and it executes it. Okay. If I want to call this from inside another Python file, this is now a module. So I could say import soundspeed. Yeah, so it's it's flexible, but that also makes it complex where there's no simple answer, right? But basically what I'm asking is, what are all the modules mm -hmm. available in Cantera? And you're saying find them in examples. That, that would be the practical use case. You can also look in the document. If you go to the documentation, documentation. Yeah. That, that shows uh, all of the, the That's true, yeah. Ways. Yeah. Come on. So here, you have uh, all oh, of the ways that you can that. represent different phases. <laughs> From generic solutions, the pure fluids that we talked a little bit about before, interfaces between different phases, uh, the different ways that you can evaluate thermodynamics, the chemical kinetics, the transports, the different reactors that we have, the one-dimensional flows, and then there's some built-in physical constants. So this is a list of everything. Okay. This is not how you're going to apply them. Though. Right. This is that would be in the example. These are all the modules. Yes. yes. Okay, and that's good. That's that's kind of what I want. And there's sort of two levels I'd say there, right? Because this is sort of the in the core of Cantera, and then these are applications that rely on those. Sort yes. Of. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The other thing is <coughs> you won't find this in that Python documentation, but like the actual, like the different uh, thermodynamic models, like that's not really listed there. But that you need to look at to control that a little more is in the C++ documentation. There's you can find the actual list of all the thermodynamic models. Yeah, go for it, yeah. Um, so uh, if I go to the list of classes, so the, the main one for the, um, is, uh, is the, one is, the main one for all the thermodynamics is, this is the thermophase class. And so this is the, the list of all the different thermodynamic models that come from things. So like, Somewhere in here is the ideal gas, but then there's also, so here's the, the red lake Kuang one. Um, there's the pure fluid one in here. There's, there's surface phase, edge phase, interface, um, you know, things like that. And there's a whole mess of, of other models. Um, so like that's kind of what's, what's there, there in detail. The documentation for this is not complete. I think it, it, it really belongs in that science section on the website at some point, but you know, something we'll get to one of these days. Yeah. So let me uh, switch now to do uh, Kemkin conversion because I can go through that pretty quickly, and then we'll go th then we'll go to lunch. So, how many people have used Kemkin models before, or used Kemkin? Or okay, awesome. So what I want to talk about a little bit is that um, sometimes, and this is probably the most common question we get on the user group, I would say, is is errors in uh, converting uh, mechanisms. So. Um, Cantera comes with a script <coughs> called uh, CK2CTI. Okay. So CK2CTI stands for Kemkin2 Cantera input. And it's going to convert your Kemkin input file, uh, the reactions, the thermodynamics, and the transport data, uh, and any surface chemistry that you may have uh, from the Kemkin input format to uh, the CTI Cantera input format. And so there's a few ways that you can call CK2CTI. You can call it directly from the command line. Um, uh, you can call it using Python with this dash M switch. Or what we're going to do here is that if you're already running a Python interpreter, you can import the convert mech function and actually run that, that function in the interpreter. Okay. So um, 
let me just show the, the signature here of the function so we can see some of the inputs that we need. So with the convert neck input, there are, uh, there's one mandatory argument, which is the input file. So in the Kemkin standard for the input files, uh, that's where you're going to declare your elements, your species, and your reactions. Optionally, in that same file, you can also declare the thermodynamics data and the transport data. Okay? So the input file is, for, <coughs> for most cases, it's going to be the elements, the species, and the reactions. Um, there's a slight convention to call that with the extension the INP. Uh, so it's something I've seen somewhat frequently. Okay? Then there are a whole bunch of other arguments uh, that you can give to convert mech. And these same arguments can be passed as options on the command line as well. So if you're using CK ck2cti, you would say dash dash input equals your input file. So you can specify a thermal file. If your input file does not contain the thermodynamics data, then you need to specify the thermal file. This is usually, uh, I think the convention is generally to use a .dat extension, uh, depending on where you're getting the mechanism from. Uh, sometimes everything's got a txt extension. But, um, so this thermal file, for most Kempkin input, I think it's going to be the NASA uh, coefficient, NASA polynomial coefficients. And I'll show a, a, an example of, some examples of what the format of some of these look like. The next argument is uh, a transport file. So it, again, if your transport data is not specified in that input file, there's typically a separate uh, file that encodes the transport data, the, the Leonard Jones parameters and so forth that are mostly used. If you have any surface chemistry, that's going to be in a separate file, the surface file here that you can specify. We saw with the, the CTI file that there's a name that's associated with that phase. The example I showed with the liquid vapor, the name was water. There's an option here that you can pass in to tell it that name. The out name is the name of the output CTI file that's going to be written to your disk. Whether or not to show some output on the terminal. And then this permissive option as well that we'll get to. Uh, kind of at the end of this page here. Okay. So those are the, the arguments there. Um, unfortunately, the Kemkin interpreter for these input files is not very strict about following their own format. So uh, there are input files that Kemkin will read that have data in them that uh, if you look at it, it's, it doesn't, it's not following the standard that Kemkin themselves have uh, outlined. So uh, in this example, we have this input file here uh, that I'm going to use to show some of the common, the most common errors that can happen when you go and try and convert a mechanism, okay? And, and show you kind of how to interpret those errors. So uh, we're going to start by uh, trying to convert this mechanism here. The, mech is, the mechanism is called mech.txt. The thermo file is called thermo.txt. The transport file is called tran.txt. And we're going to specify that it should be saved in a file called mech.cti. So if I run this cell, you can already see the output there. It says, uh, and the output on the command line, if you're using the, the terminal to run ck2.cti, is going to look very similar. It won't be colored, uh, most likely, but it will look pretty similar. Okay. So it says, unable to parse the input file near line 73. So this refers to the line in the actual input file. So when you see this error message come out, what you can do is actually open up this uh, file in a text editor on your computer. Uh, if you're on Windows, the one that I like is called Notepad++. It's a relatively lightweight uh, text editor, but it will also show you the line numbers in the margin of every line in the file. Okay. So on line 73, we couldn't figure out what to do with some data that's, that is, is uh, on that line. So if we scroll down a little more, it will actually tell us what is the problem with that line that we, uh, that we had there? And so uh, in reading this, this particular line, Kintera, CK2CTI found the reactions definition. Right? So in the input file format for Kempkin, there's, uh, to declare the start of the reaction section, you put the word reactions. And so Kintera was trying to parse that line, and it found this extra bit on the end of the line. Okay. So, Basically, when you're looking at these errors, what you want to do is look at the, the, the line that's at the top and then the line that's at the very bottom. And you can kind of ignore everything that's in the middle. That's just coming from, uh, from the internals of Python and how Python will report errors. CK2CTI is a Python script that's running. Okay, so the, again, that's the first line in the error output and then the last line. 
Okay, so that's what I have here. Error unable to parse on line 73, unrecognized token. So let's take a look at that input file. And I just extracted a snippet from the input file here. You find the end of the species section. So uh, in the Chemkin input file format, you have an element section. It says elements, H-N-O-C-A-R, usually something like that, and then end. And then you're going to specify all of the species that are going to be used in this mechanism. So you say species, and you list all the species, and you say end. And then you start the reaction section. Okay, so you say reactions, and then you go into the reaction section. But according to the standard, the only thing that should be on this line is the word reactions. But in this mechanism file, someone has added with probably a comment to say that for uh, reactions that involve a third body collider, M, that the base of that, we're going to assume that M is equal to nitrogen. So most likely this is a comment that the mechanism author wrote to the users of the mechanism or the, the uh, uh, themselves, like if they were going back to look at it. But because this kind of input is not specified in the uh, Kemkin documentation, we don't know what to do with it. Kemkin just ignores this. As far as I know, Kemkin just ignores that line or that end of the line there. Once it sees, actually I think once it sees REAC, it just assumes that what's coming next is going to be reactions and, and ignores the rest of the, of the of that one. I think is what happens. You can specify. There's a few things that you can specify in the reaction line. You can specify energy units. For yes. Example, but yeah. But we don't know what to do with base. Know, no. Base is, is not something that we know what to do with. So when we don't know what to do with something, in this case, we tell you, right? Because you, as the human, as the user of this software, have to figure out what that means and what to do about it. In this case, I think it's most likely a comment, so we can just delete it off of that line. Okay. So I created a, a new mechanism file where I deleted that uh, line, the offending, well, the offending end of that line anyways, called it mech underscore fixed, and then we're going to run that conversion again. And uh, this time, we're getting an error output in the thermal entry. Okay, so here, uh, these info statements that don't say error are not errors, they're just warnings. And uh, what's happening here on these lines is that in the thermal database, there are these species specified that have uh, thermal data specified in the thermal database that are not declared in the species section of the input file. Okay? Again, we don't know what to do with that, but it's not an error. Right? We just ignore that, that data because we won't end up needing it anyways. But we're going to tell you about it so that you know. Then uh, the actual error is here, error while reading this thermal entry starting on line 523. So we go to line 523 in thermo.txt, and actually we would find this, this output. So this is a typical NASA 7 coefficient polynomial, the, the Gordon McBride uh, formulation, uh, high temperature, low temperature polynomials for the uh, thermodynamics data for a, a ideal gas species. And so this is the uh, output. This is where we found the error. Line 523 actually happens to be this line here, although it's not... Shown here, this is kind of like the, the context around that, and this is the actual um, uh, thermal entry that's there. So actually the line, the error is actually on line 526, uh, which is the last line down here, but the, the start of that thermodynamics entry is on the line 523. Okay, so again, let me scroll down to my text here at the bottom. It's giving us this kind of rather cryptic error, could not convert string to float, E minus 08 space, negative 0 0.32. And the way that the, uh, the thermodynamic files are specified is as a fixed format. So in column one to column, say, 15 on that first line, there's some expected uh, uh, text that should be there. And then for the next set of columns, there's some text that's there. And for the next set of columns, there's some text that's there. So what, Ka what Kantera is trying to do is the columns ended up somehow in between two numbers here. And so we're trying to convert this kind of random string of characters into a number, and that, and that doesn't work very well. Okay, so this error is actually a, a pretty tricky one to figure out. Um, and to figure this out, and my, my suggestion when you're looking at any of these files is to use an editor that's going to show you what the white space is, whether it's a tab character uh, or a space character. Because the fixed format here expects everything to be spaces, but in this case, in the line here, and I can actually let me open this uh, so we can see. Thermal. Wow, he's doing that all 
often say, this is an example. If you're going to, you know, if you're going to email the user group, right? Include CCI file. Include a copy and paste of the error message, not a screenshot. Yeah, not, well, not the CTI filing. In this case, the Chemkin files. Chemkin, that's right. Because you Sorry, don't have Chemkin a CTI file. Right, yeah. right. So again, we're not expecting you to be able to go and debug every error. But if you hit this and you're at a dead end, include enough information that we could reproduce it, and also not screenshots, but copy and paste, which is fast for anybody. So yes. Let's... OK, so looking at this is the line. This is the thermo entry that I'm worried about here. And you can see here, there's actually two spaces, or there's two places where on this intro line here, or the, the, the first line, there are tab characters instead of space characters. And the standard says that there should be a certain number of spaces between each of these entries on that line, not tabs. So when you put tabs in there, we read that as one character instead of four or, or three or however many characters are supposed to be there. And so everything gets shifted off, which is how we ended up trying to convert, like, the end of one number in the beginning of the next number. Okay. So my suggestion is to use a text editor that's going to show you line numbers and the type of white space characters that you have there. On Windows, again, Notepad++ is really good. Uh, on Mac, I believe you can configure the default text editor to show those things. Uh, if not, something like, um, I don't know, like uh, Atom, which is ATOM, which is a text editor from GitHub, is quite good. Uh, Visual Studio Code from Microsoft is also quite good. There's a number of options there. Okay. All right. So that is what happens to be the problem with this thermo entry: is that the format doesn't again match the the specified format. Other really common errors in thermo entries: these four numbers over here are supposed to all be down the same column. Actually, the 80th column here. Uh, this is a, an outcome of the Fortran heritage of this uh, input format where the cards that you would write the code on were 80 characters wide. Okay, so this, uh, you'll, we often see mechanisms where uh, these numbers end up in the wrong column, the 78th column or the 81st column or something like that. And again, because it's a fixed format and there's supposed to be some certain information in every column, then we do our best. But again, we're just going to tell you that there's, that there's a problem there. And, and ask you to fix it. Okay. So uh, if we fix that, I make a file called thermo fixed, and I can run that again. And here we get one more error. So this is the uh, unexpected species output that we had before. Now we have one more error here, and this is in our transport data. Uh, this error also comes up pretty frequently in thermo data. Is that in that input file for the transport data, we ended up with two definitions of the transport properties for this species, uh, NCN. Okay. And the duplicate that we found was on line 152 of that uh, uh, transport file. Okay. And here again, Kent, uh, Kentera doesn't know what to do with that duplicate data. It doesn't know which one it should pick. Because uh, it doesn't know, uh, Kentera can't read the mechanism author's mind and figure out what's going on there. This comes up pretty often as well as, uh, as I said in the thermo data, because people tend to copy and paste thermal data files around, and they end up with duplicate definitions of, of species in those files. So if I take a snip of the output, or sorry, of the input file from the transport, at line 108 is the original definition of, of the transport data for species NCN, and line 152 is the uh, duplicated definition here. We can actually see in this case that in terms of the numbers that are here, they're totally identical. And so it doesn't actually matter which one we pick. If there was a difference in the numbers, again, Cantera has no idea which one is supposed to be the correct one. If I recall, what Kenkin does correctly is that it just picks the first one. Uh, it just takes the first one by default. Um, so in this case, uh, it doesn't matter which one of these we pick. And so we can use the permissive option, that, that option that I, that I mentioned above. We can pass in the permissive option that tells Cantera, just do your best with this. When there's duplicate stuff like this, just take the first one and keep going. Warn me about it, but let it pass and, and get an output from that. Okay, so we can then specify the permissive option here, permissive equals true. And finally, in the end, we end up with a CTI file that has 129 species and, and 1,200 or so reactions in it. Okay, so uh, those are the, some of the common errors that you'll encounter. We've also, uh, I went through one day in grad school when I was bored and read the Kemkin uh, spec uh, and did my best to interpret it and uh, wrote out uh, 
pretty long <laughs> section here on uh, it's kind of summarizing the standard that are at least public, publicly available. Uh, and you can take a look at those and figure out, um, uh, possibly figure out what's going wrong. Again, here's, I have a table that specifies all of the column numbers for all of the different things that are supposed to be in the thermal entries. And then, uh, and the species entries down here at the bottom, sorry, the transport entries down here at the bottom. Okay. So uh, as Steven said earlier, uh, and uh, if you run into this kind of error, this is really common, uh, unfortunately really common, uh, converting input files from Kimkin. So uh, if you can't solve it, if you look through this kind of information here and you can't figure out what's going wrong, there are cases where it's just totally uh, crazy uh, what's happening there. We've improved that converter over the last several years uh, to try and give you better error output. But if you really can't figure out what's going on, please make a post on the user group, attach the mechanism file, and then paste in the, the error output as text in your post. Okay. Any questions about the, that conversion? Okay. All right, so I, th I think we're at, uh, at lunch now, a little, a little